Himalayan Expedition, Dr. Kajal Saikya, Chief General Manager, HRN Legal, Numaliga Refinery Limited, Srimati Anagha Pujari, Group Head, CSR, Kalpataru Foundation, Srimati Shushma Rawat, Executive Director, ONGC, Srimati Amrita Ganguly, Head, Partnerships, Tata Steel Foundation. And also would like to request the three remaining speakers uh, that we were enabled to proceed. You may also please come on the dais. This session will be moderated by Sri Rennie Wilfred IS, Joint Secretary, IDENT. May I kindly request all the delegates to please come to the conclave. At four o'clock, we have our valedictory session, and after which there will be a meeting, so requesting to move on time, and we'll appreciate your cooperation, please. May I request all the stall in charges to kindly come to the hall, all the stall in charges. May I request our volunteers to please request our stall in charges to fill the halls, and also our delegates, wherever you are, kindly come to the hall. May I request Sri Sheikh Dream a Dream, Sri Hanuman Rawat, American Indian Foundation, Sri Manmohan Singh, Kaivalya Foundation to kindly come on the dais. I would like to request uh, our um, members on the dais as we are quite challenged with the time, I would like to request you to please uh, have that in mind and proceed so that everyone is able to share their thoughts in a few minutes. I'm sorry um, we had to cut short, but we are very happy that you are here to share your thoughts with us. So may I request everybody to please come in so that we can start. Hello, Chair. May I request... Hello, Chair. May I request for the sharing of experiences in implementing CSR projects to be led by the session moderator, Sri Rennie Wilfred, AIS, Joint Secretary, Island, to kindly take the stage and proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, we know that it is too hot today. It was an unexpected turn of event. Kohima is usually not this hot. I don't know, maybe something good is happening. Uh, since there is a shortage of time, I will not be taking much of the time. We have an eminent group of dignitaries on the dais who will be sharing their experiences about what they have done and what is the inspiration that Nagaland can draw from it, and what they look forward from Nagaland to take forward those initiatives that they have done in other parts of the country. Each of the speakers have excelled in their specific areas, and they have their passion. Those people sitting here is uh, driven by passion, not because of the uh, academic uh, qualifications. So, I would request all of you to share that passion with all the people uh, who are present here so that they carry forward the flame from you to do the best in their life for the benefit of everyone. Thank you. Hello. 
So to begin with, I would like to call upon Padma Bhushan Dr. Bindeshwar Pathak, the founder of Sulup International, to take the stage and share his experience with us. So. Honorable Shiremi Bilfred G. I.S. Joint Secretary, Idan, Honorable Pravina Ji, and all other presenters with me, and the persons in the audience. I feel proud and privileged that I have been given some time to share my experiences of the last 52 years. Uh, because uh, time is very short, so I wouldn't like to go in detail. I would like to cross the limitation given to us. So just I say that when I was working in Bihar Gandhi Centenary Celebration Committee in the year 1968, 69, 70. In 70, it was to be wind up. So the Honorable Chief Minister asked the Minister concerned that how we can carry forward this Bhangi Mukti program. Because by the government or the NGO alone, it cannot be carried forward. So he asked the minister concerned to find out or search for an NGO. As time is short, so I am not going into detail. Just say the minister asked me to form the organization. I formed the organization and applied for the grant of 70 thousand rupees. It took about three years to file go from finance to planning to urban development. So after three years of within three years, an IAS officer, he asked me to come and said, look, a file has come to me to grant you 50 thousand rupees. But if you take this money, then after one year, finance department will raise many objections and you will have to reply and you cannot get the money soon. Again, it will take two years. So I suggest you don't take grant. You just take money for the implementation of the program. And after saving, you run the organization. So those who are from the NGOs, these two lessons or suggestions given by one political person and one IAS official, sort of is the creation of these two persons. Now, first work I got of rupees 500 just to put up two toilets as a demonstration in Aram municipality in Bihar. And 
the file was being moved from one department to another. So finally, in April, uh, this 30th April, 1974, the Sula Bal recognized by the government to work as a cutting agency. This is for the NGO, you must hear me very intently. That I invented the technology first. Without invention, nothing would have been possible, and there was no chance of any difference in life of the people or in the environment. So, what I did, that I took up that money and in the entire state, our work has started. Then one person came as an IAS officer, a uh, Patna Municipal Corporation administrator, and he said, we have an urgent need to put up a public toilet in such a such place. I will give you money and land for the construction, but I will not pay you for the maintenance. And uh, you can charge some money. So first money we charge, 10 paise per person. And the first day, I don't want to go in detail in the story, so first day 500 people came to use the toilets. Now, today, 20 million people daily use 10,000 public toilets built by us with the assistance of the government and the local bodies. Then the fund started dwindling in the government. It's a coincidence. The, the shortage of fund to the government and rich people, rich companies, fortunately, they got inspired to spend some money for the welfare of the community. Earlier, seldom there was somebody who can contribute something. So now, through CSR, CSR, sorry, CSR, we have built thousands and thousands of public toilets, household toilets, school toilets, and we are propagating the idea throughout the country. We have not taken a single farthing as a donation, as a grant so far. 50,000 people are working in Sulab without any burden on public exchequer. This is the best example in the world that an NGO can run a group of 50,000 people, but no grant, no donation, only the work. Why somebody will give you the work? If you take the work and you don't go, do properly, nobody will give you. That you have to uh, uh, do the, perform the, the right work. I guess I could conclude now that uh, Rajasthan government has, Sulaf does not give tender. It is unheard in these days, no tender. But I say, no, I cannot give you tender. If you want to give me work, give me. If you don't want to work, no problem. Thank you. And the government of Rajasthan and all the government of India, state governments I mean, they have changed their by laws and laws. And they are giving work to Sula because our values are based on honesty and integrity. 
So if you are running an NGO, you will have to be honest, sincere, people should believe you, and then two things I say and I conclude just because the many things are there. One, that Prabhinaji is the inspiration for giving work from the Boeing. Many projects we have done from the one from the schools, now we are building toilets in the household toilets, now public toilets. And here I have come because of her inspiration. So I am thankful to her that the Boeing is also helping us. 143 companies of India are working with us. And the last is that the government of Rajasthan, they have changed their rules for awarding the work to Sula. So all the NGOs who are here, there are many things to say, but time is off, uh, over. So the Sula has technology, the BBC has featured the Sulab technology as one of the five inventions of the world. Now, millions of inventions have been done in this world, but Sulab is among the five. So that is the success. So I inspire you and yours to work with government, because without government, you cannot go forward. So this is the principle. And now CSR has come, fortunately. And now they are helping uh, to the cause. So I think this is good for India that the companies have come forward to help in different fields, not sanitation, education, health, and so on and so forth. With these words, I thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Indeed, an inspiration. And I do hope that each one listening takes your idea and your thoughts forward in their work. With this note, I would like to call upon Srimati Praveena Yaknambhad, the Chief of Staff, Boeing, India. A very warm um, good afternoon to everyone in Kohima. Like Mr. Welfred said, everyone expected the climate to be otherwise, but this is equally beautiful. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to the beautiful people of this uh, beautiful part of India, Nagaland. Thank you to everyone who's put this event together and given us an opportunity to show what we are doing. Thank you to all the officers and the team from Government of Nagaland who's been at our service 24 by 7. So my heartfelt thank you to each one of you. DPO, wherever you are sitting, thank you. And there are several others. But you've been relentless. And thank you so much uh, for supporting us and being the helping hand that we need here. Um, if I ever had the option, Kohima could be my home. Thank you so much once again. Uh, let's just talk about what uh, we've done in the rest of India. A uh, couple of things that I have uh, picked up from uh, the conclave since yesterday um, is this. I was not aware um, of how culturally rich we always heard. But since yesterday, or even in my previous visit, I've got a first-hand little knowledge of how beautiful, how resourceful, how rich Nagaland is. Most of Northeast India is. I have traveled extensively within the Northeastern states and learned a lot. So um, Nagaland is a very rich, resourceful state. We are very, very proud uh, to be partnering uh, with the state in making a small difference in this uh, state. Two, that I'm extremely proud 
grateful and thankful to all the partners that have come along with me, with Boeing, to be here with all of you. First of all, thank you, Dr. Pathak. He says I am his inspiration, but he inspires the country, and I don't want to say anything more than that. Dr. Rajat Jain, President Boeing India, words will not suffice my gratitude to this organization called Doctors for You. Um, in a minute, I can start crying for the amount of work this organization does across the country. They are, I'm so proud, so happy, and so grateful that they have helped us take up several initiatives in the state of Nagaland. The Honorable Finance Minister will be inaugurating the 10 bedded dialysis center that we have set up with support from Doctors for You. Uh, they will be now taking up the cause of running the center of excellence for the nursing college that we will be supporting them with. Our support is mostly just financial, uh, but passion drives me to get deeper than finances into it, but the real credit does go to people who implement it on ground. Uh, and then of course, because we got introduced through Mr. Wilfred to others, they will be taking up several other initiatives um, in the state. The next five years will be interesting to see how the success of any of our initiatives show up. And then I think we have a very certain way pay forward to see what we can do further. Uh, Sudeep from Learning Links Foundation is my partner in crime in anything that I want to do. Uh, I will be short of words to express my gratitude to Mr. Rennie Wilfred for this amazing concept of Kofu. It has taken up everybody's attention. People are excited. I am excited. I'm also excited for the learning opportunity that Kofu will provide to us. Uh, one of my partners, Ramesh Swami from Unnati, is not here, but he is the one who will be taking up skill development and animation um, in this state. Uh, and then, of course, Sulab is setting up the public toilet in Dimapur District Hospital. Uh, what are we going to do next? I've had several interactions with several people in the last 24 hours that have been here. Um, I saw a presentation of the district of Samator. Is that Samator? Shamator. Shamator. I think Raj, between Rajat and uh, Sudeep, Three of the five can be taken care of immediately. Rajat has told me that he will work on the district hospital project and in the next one month we should have some change, visible change in that place. Um, Sudip will take up uh, the school projects to help children out there. Um, I also just met the police commissioner who talked about um, uh, you know, some facilities, some help they need. Uh, for the police department and their family members, we are happy to take those up as well. Uh, allow us some time, and I think over a period of time, we will like to get um, more knowledge and see how many more partnerships we can develop um, in the state and see where this journey takes us. Like someone said, and I just read it uh, in Dr. Patak's uh, presentation, ask not what the country does for you ask what you can do for your country. If there's a little bit of inspiration we can take from that. I think we are all here just with that one, one vision, one mission to see what we can do for our country. Thank you for everything that everybody is doing. We are happy to be a part of a very small part of the change that we want to see for ourselves in this part of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for taking forward and encouraging our audience here and also giving us the hope that it is possible. It is here on this note, I would like to call upon Sri Jaydeep Bansal, CEO, Global Himalayan Expedition. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, first of all, can we all give a big round of applause to the entire audience sitting here? It's hot, it's humid, but you're braving it out since morning, listening to all the presenters. So 
you know, hats off to everyone who's sitting here in the audience. Uh, thank you for having the patience and courage to go through the entire day and listen to so many presentations and so many wonderful ideas that have been presented here. Let's also give a big round of applause to the government of Nagaland and IDAN for actually hosting this event and getting everyone as here. It takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of commitment, and they have done it. So great job, everyone. I'm Jaydeep Bansal. I'm the CEO of GHE. We are a social enterprise, so we are the ones who actually implement projects on the ground. And for us, the whole motivation is to live, leverage technology to bring in sustainable development to the remotest communities of India. The way we want to put our tagline is, where the road stops, that's where our work begins. So when we are told that there is a very remote village, it takes uh, 10, day, uh, you know, 10 hours or it will take two days to reach that village, I get very excited because I know that is the place to go because that is where development is required the most. So these are the geographies we have been operating in from Ladakh to the Northeast. And this is the impact portfolio that we have. So we work on electrifying villages to setting up education centers to upgrading health centers. We have talked about health a lot here. And then looking at carbon neutrality, deploying low carbon solutions for the communities, and also looking at livelihood development through homestay-based tourism, because all these remote areas are fertile ground for developing sustainable tourism through homestays. So this is the impact we've had over the last eight years. We've reached out to more than 600 villages to impact the lives of 300,000 people across five regions of India. And coming uh, about us, you know, I'm not from the social sector background. I used to, I'm an IIT Bombay graduate. I used to work with Procter & Gamble making and selling shampoo. But after five years in the company, I realized that's not my, what my dream in life was. But then that's what, uh, you know, a lot of inspiration took us to these remote corners of India, starting from Ladakh. But specifically here, I'll talk about the work that we are doing in the northeast part of India, which is where we began in the Garo region in Meghalaya, where we started electrifying villages, to now actually, uh, you know, uh, bringing sustainable energy access to the communities. And then we happened to post one of the pictures on Facebook and someone from Nagaland in one of the remote villages called Shinyu village, which you see on the picture here, saw that Facebook post and he contacted us. And who that person is, I'll come to later. This is the village of Shinyu. This is the last village of India practically. The hill opposite the village is in Myanmar. It is a 60 household village with no electricity, poor road conditions. So this is how we were going there. And I remember uh, Thavasilina, sir, who's the deputy commissioner of Mon, that time he said, it's a very remote village. It will take you two days to reach. We said, perfect, let's go, because that's where development has to come. And so this is the team when they received the solar materials for the first time. The entire village gathered together. It was like a celebration in the village. Every boy, every auntie, every uncle, everyone was coming together. And this is how we were welcomed in the village, in the traditional dance form. And the community was just so excited that they are now getting access to clean energy. And then what happened next was in just three days, the whole team along with the villagers set up the entire solar grids and the village transformed from complete darkness to having light in each and every room, in each and every house, the church, but also for, if you look at it from the outside, this is how the village looks like. I mean, next slide. And so this is how the village, so it really brings the village into existence, right? So earlier we captured a photo of the night time, there was nothing and suddenly you have this village in the middle of the mountain and the villagers were so happy because they knew that their counterparts in Burma, line of sight you could see a village there that was in darkness and this village was in electricity. So that's what really bringing development to these villages mean and this is the person who sent us that Facebook message, he is sitting in the audience, Brother John, can you please stand up? So that's the person there. It's a local Nagaland entrepreneur who's reached out and now he's trained more than 15 people here as solar engineers. And in fact, next month we are deploying solar grids in many more villages in the Mon district itself. And it is not just about, you know, bringing a bunch of people from Bangalore or Delhi here to bring development, but it is about how do you ensure capacity development of the local communities uh, for both men and women. And trust me, nothing against the men in the room. The women in these areas are much more hardworking than the men. And that's what we have seen with our engineers and with our, uh, you know, our on-ground teams. And so this was the solar engineering that we did in partnership with the administration. So to all the organizations that are out here, 
do partner with the district administrations. The deputy commissioners here are some of the finest IAS officers that you will ever come across, and they are ready to bring development. They are ready to leave behind a legacy of their postings in these districts. So please go ahead and reach out to these IAS officers. Now from electricity, the next step was to set up education centers. So we have been setting up digital innovation centers in government and private schools where there is no access to computer. But the moment you set up a solar power and you set up computers, it just exposes the students to a broad range of topics on science, English, maths. And all of that content is digitized from the sixth grade to the 10th grade. We then move towards the health centers. So this is the example of some of these uh, centers. On health, what we are doing is not just solar powering the health centers, but what do we do with that solar power? So that means the next step is to install critical medical care equipment. So we partner with the medical administration, and we have a list of 25 equipments that we install in these primary health centers to really upgrade the health centers. But more importantly, imagine a rural woman who's coming to this primary health center for a delivery, only to find out that her delivery will be carried out under candlelight because there is no electricity, there is no equipment. I, I just became a father. I have a two-year-old two year daughter, and I realized the access to health facilities that I had as a father, but these communities don't have. But who are these mountains, who are these jungles to deprive the local communities here with the best and the modern facilities? And that's the mission that we are coming with, that why don't we provide them with the latest facilities, but also try to localize everything. Why can't we have a make in Nagaland? If we are doing so many electrifications, if the administration is putting up so many street lights, why can't they be assembled in Nagaland itself? Why can't you have assembly stations, train the local community? It's a very simple assembly process. Why do you have to buy from ba Delhi or Bangalore? So that's what we are also doing. And lastly, people talked it's very difficult to leverage financing in the Northeast. You have to be creative about it. Nowadays, everyone wants to become net zero. Where will they get net zero? Where will they get their carbon offsets? Northeast is the place because there's a lot of firewood being used for cooking. So what we are doing is deploying clean energy solutions, clean cook stoves, and over the next three to five years, we are deploying half a million cook stoves that will offset more than 7.5 million tons of carbon emissions. And these projects are now being funded by a lot of companies who want to become net zero because they're all gold standard or VCS registered. So you have to be innovative to find out ways in terms of how can you attract financing to such geographies and not just wonder that, OK, nobody finances, OK, there's no point doing a project. Uh, but it's not just that you can parachute into a village and say, OK, you, we are here as your saviors, and we will bring development. It does not work that way. Development is always a two-way street. So you have to engage the communities. You have to go to each household. You have to do the deployment. You have to make them part of the solution rather than throwing and or just giving away stuff. And so what we have done is we have used intelligence, uh, which uh, even the IDEN presented. So all of our projects are geotag, geomap. And then finally, as the last bit, uh, so we can skip these slides, uh, coming to the homestay piece, so the livelihood piece, where what we are doing is uh, setting up homestay-based tourism. Of course, these are some of the other projects. But on the homestay tourism, because these remote villages have a have brilliant entrepreneurs. If you, if you really ask me, entrepreneurship, it exists in the Northeast. It exists in these states. So what we can do is we are setting up such homestays where we are upgrading the room of the villagers, training the woman, the household, or training the lady of the household as homestay host. And now they are welcoming travelers by creating that market linkage. But not just that. Northeast has clear night skies besides the clouds. So why don't we put up telescopes? We have already done this in many geographies in Ladakh, where we are setting up telescopes, training the community on astro tourism. So now you have astro stays being set up in most of these geographies uh, in uh, uh, you know, these areas. Now, I am not an NGO. My organization is not an NGO. So we have been talking about NGOs this morning. You need a CSR 112A, all that. It's fine. But I would request everyone in the audience here that it does not mean that tomorrow you start going out, out and opening NGOs with all the registrations. We are a for-profit social enterprise, and we are proud about it. Because if I'm a for-profit social enterprise, my profits, if I have to put food on my table, it has to be linked to the development of the community. Otherwise, I don't get anything. And so that's how we are structured. There are ways and means where you can leverage CSR funding even as a for-profit social enterprise. And this is just the partners that we have in the Northeast, from Infosys, Tata, to Aon, PNG, Apple. So all these partners that we are working with, and even with the MBDA, which is the Meghalaya Basin Development Authority. So in a nutshell, uh, you know, there is a lot of development opportunities. Does not mean that everyone outside this room now has to go up and open an NGO. 
there are ways and means you can attract financing. You have to be smart about the solutions that you provide to the communities. And end of the day, like they say, you know, do not feed the fish, but teach them how to fish because that can only ensure that the Northeast and the states like Nagaland really jump frog the whole transition and move from poverty to prosperity. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And I do hope that people will see you after this session. May I call upon Dr. Kajal Saikya, Chief General Manager, HRN Legal, Numaligar Refinery. Good afternoon. I think Mr. Bansal deserves one more round of big applause from all of you for his fired up speech. Thank you. Mr. Wilfred, uh, it's really a pleasure seeing you in person. And we've been interacting with you for the last two months. Uh, and I congratulate you for organizing such a wonderful event, finally, for the last two days. Sir, it's a privilege of, uh, for us, maybe for all the people sitting in the dais, to be sitting in the same dais as you, with you. Uh, Namaskar and Pranam from my side. Pravinaji and other dignitaries in the dais. Uh, I'll not uh, make a very long speech because I've been here uh, from yesterday and personally for me it's a very big learning experience altogether. Uh, from uh, having the opportunity to listen to Honorable Finance Minister, Chief Minister of uh, Nagaland, and then also uh, to be a part of uh, last evening's interaction with all corporate, you know, big guys from both private and public sector industries, CII uh, authorities, uh, and so many learning points came up. Uh, so I am overwhelmed with this experience. I once again thank the organizers for giving us an opportunity to be here. Uh, basically, uh, I'd like to uh, dwell upon two points. One, I think Nagaland has already taken up a leadership role among all the underdeveloped states in the country. Because development is a matter of degree. Uh, some states are more developed than other states. Some countries are more developed than the other countries. So I also belong to a uh, underdeveloped state. It's Assam, maybe slightly developed uh, than, that, than the state of Nagaland. So I think Nagaland has uh, taken up a leadership role for all the underdeveloped states in the country. So a big round of applause for the government of Nagaland. I want to hear some more. I think all the other states will also take a cue from Nagaland in organizing such uh, conventions, such conclaves, and to invite and attract all the people to come and invest in their respective states. Second point, I will tell you a story. I represent a company, a three million refinery, uh, oil refining company. The company was set up in the year 1993. When the uh, company was first set up, when it was declared that a three million refinery will be set up in Assam, in Golaghat district, then in Assam there was a lot of euphoria. Oh, finally a three million uh, metric ton refinery is coming, com coming up in the state. There will be a lot of opportunities for employment. That, was the, that is the inside perception. But if you look at the outside perception, how uh, a refinery 3MMTP capacity is looked upon by the people outside the state of Assam. 3MMTP refinery, it's such a small refinery. Is it really viable economically? Because at that point of time, economically, 3 million metric ton refinery was not very attractively and economically viable. So there are always two sides uh, how we look at things. But Finally, eventually, Numali Refinery came up. It was commissioned in the year 2000. And 
people of Nagaland will be knowing NRL is set up in a district in Assam which is also not very much developed. There are no, no, not a single industry in that district, in the nearby districts also. So uh, imagine a refinery being set up in 750 acres of land and then a beautiful township which was also set up in around 300 acres of land. Hundreds of vehicles spying on the road and then the management of the company realized that NRL is really an island of prosperity in the sea of depravity. Because the people who were living in the area surrounding the refinery did not have anything, did not have good opportunities for education, did not have good opportunities for healthcare, there are not very good infrastructure facilities, uh, there are not very good, you know, facilities for development of sports, culture, and other activities. So what NRL started doing is NRL started investing on the developmental activities even from the project stage, even before the refinery was commissioned and even before refinery started earning any money. So that way, refinery started building a relationship with the people who were staying around the area of the refinery and we started developing a very healthy relationship with the refinery. Uh, sorry, the, the nearby, nearby areas people. And the nearby areas people started owning the refinery. They started saying, it's our refinery, it's our company. So that's the story of NRL. We started with a 3 MMTP refinery. We didn't venture into the other parts of the state of Assam for our development activities because there was so much to do in the district itself. We even didn't go to uh, the uh, districts like Kamrup, Gwalpara, Nogao, Jodha, Dibrugar. We all restricted our CSR activities within the district of Golaghat where we were established. But now, Numoliga refinery is expanding from 3 MMTV to 9 MMTV refinery uh, because of uh, uh, lack of required quantity of crude oil will be importing crude oil from the Middle East and we'll be uh, bringing in crude oil from a uh, port in Paradip in Urissa across four states in the country. We'll be bringing in crude from Paradip through the states of Jharkhand, Bihar, West Bengal to Assam. Uh, so we are also uh, gradually becoming a national company, uh, having presence in number of states in the country. Additionally, we are also venturing into a biorefinery where uh, we'll be producing ethanol from bamboo. That is the major point we can, where in which we can uh, establish some more connectivity with the people of Nagaland because the biorefinery in uh, Nomaligar will be requiring five lakh tons of bamboo, green bamboo every year. So that's a huge requirement and Nagaland being an uh, abundantly bamboo producing state, uh, definitely in the years to come, Nagaland and uh, Numoliga refinery uh, will be having a, a very permanent kind of a relationship which will open up a lot of uh, CSR initiatives also for the uh, company. So I look forward to the coming uh, near the, near, near, nearby future, next five to 10 years to have a very uh, uh, very beautiful relationship with the people of Nagaland uh, for facilitating sourcing of green bamboo which will create uh, employment opportunities for all the people of Nagaland across the state. And with the business relationship developing, definitely there will be a lot of opportunities for uh, CSR initiatives of the company also in the state of Nagaland. With these few words, I would like to conclude and I wish all the best to the people of Nagaland, to the organizers of this conclave, so that uh, we can see the fruits of this conclave in the uh, next few years to come. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I call upon Srimati Anagha Pujari, Group Head CSR, Kalpataru Foundation, to take the time. Good afternoon, everyone. All sleepy? You should all wake up. 
this is the time. So thank you very much, uh, Aidan, uh, for organizing this um, beautiful conference where we actually got to meet a lot of uh, CSR from across uh, the state, as well as the NGO partners, which are working again across um, India. And uh, it has been an absolute pleasure interacting with each one of them, how we are able to co-create this impact and take on Nagaland to a transformational journey. So many, many congratulations to you all. Um, just want to take a couple of minutes to thank um, especially you, uh, Mr. Renny Wilfred, because I, I guess it is always a call away that, you know, you've always been there to support us at uh, any given point of time. It has been our first uh, uh, step forward to come forth and do CSR uh, in initiatives in Nagaland. And I think, uh, uh, Renny, along with your team members, um, the education department, Mr. Uh, Tharasivan, Mr. Nalayappan, in fact, the principal, Mr. Luho, all of them were just available day in, day out at any given point of time to see that bit of transformation, the positive uh, uh, project coming across. So just to give you a brief round of introduction about myself. Uh, so I am Anaga Pujari. I'm a part of Kalpatru Group. Uh, just to give you a brief round again of introduction of the Kalpatru Group. Kalpatru is into real estate. Uh, we started off as a company in 1969 and eventually moved into the EPC sector, which is uh, constructing transmission lines, oil and, glass, uh, oil and gas infrastructure. Then we also have uh, railways electrification that we take up, including large infrastructure work in terms of um, uh, constructing flyovers and bridges uh, across India. Um, we are in around 63 countries, and uh, we are pan-India. Um, our CSR initiatives, again, are very specific to the locations that we are in. Uh, Nagaland, we had actually just um, uh, concluded one of our projects, and uh, when this initiative was being spoken about, we said, why not just come in and see wherever we were there in Nagaland, maybe you know some of these villages, some of these blocks, if we can cover through some of our initiatives. Uh, we have a very focused approach uh, towards CSR because it's a group company, so there are certain uh, parameters which are chalked out, certain strategies which are there. So we generally have to be in that ambit. So there are um, uh, four to five pillars, CSR pillars under which we work. So healthcare being one of the key ones. Healthcare, education, skilling. Um, we also work on environment. Animal welfare is also one thing which is very, very close to our promoter's heart. And uh, we are also into uh, rural uh, infrastructure related work. So uh, majorly into everything, I would say, but very specific to the location and the sites uh, where we are working in. Uh, since Nagaland was our first step forward towards CSR, we said, you know, uh, let's start off uh, in a phase wise manner and taking uh, the education as a bigger umbrella. We uh, started off by setting up of mini science centers for students who are from the first to the 10th standard who can benefit. So right from the first standard, these mini science centers give a very innovative and a very interactive approach towards learning different kind of um, uh, course curriculum which is there in science. And uh, besides that, we are also looking at uh, setting up digital smart solutions. Uh, you must have seen the Yuan stoppable stall there. So they are, they are also one of our partners. So we will be working with them. And um, uh, they will be setting up uh, some of the schools. We will be setting up these digital uh, smart classrooms. Uh, having said that, uh, since I said this is a first phase, uh, exploratory phase for us, uh, but the kind of um, support that we have uh, got from the government is amazing. And I think it's mind blowing. It's more passionate than, than I would say myself or any one of us in the team. So uh, kudos to you all. In fact, uh, that's the passion which we can take forward and do a lot of transformational work around. Um, the challenges for us at least have been in terms of identifying grassroots level organizations which are, which are credible, which are compliant, and are also doing a lot of great work. And I think the interactions that we had today, as well as the pitch, uh, pitches that we heard, I think there's great opportunity of partnerships. And uh, for sure, we'll be looking at exploring those real soon. So thank you so much. And thank you. And all the very best to you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. May I call upon Srimati Shushma Rawat, Executive Director, ONGC.
Namaskar and a very good afternoon to all the dignitaries sitting here on the dais, the captains of the industries, the wonderful people whom we have been interacting since yesterday. And in fact, uh, I had come here in July as well. So I had an opportunity and the time to interact with all of you for a day uh, uh, in July as well. I'm from ONGC, the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation Limited, and I'm the basin manager looking after the entire northeastern state, looking and discovering new pools of oil and gas. So uh, I know we've been talking about CSR in a major way, and I know what it means and what it brings. But parallel to that is also the investments that any company needs to do. So I'd be giving you a brief. I, I know I'm very, I have a limited time given. So I'll just up, touch upon, ONGC, as all of you know, is a Maharatna company. As of now, I can say the PAT is 40,000 crore, of which 2% is a sizable amount. In the Northeast, the, out of the entire strength of 26,000 employees of ONGC all over India. We are around 5,000 plus. So, uh, in fact, the story of oil in India, as most of you know, began here in Assam, in Digboy, in the Northeast. What you might not be aware is the commercial quantities that we were providing and producing, I mean, as a, as a nation or as a country or as an area, which also supported the Second World War efforts of the British Empire in the Northeastern sector. So uh, as, as the slide shows how we started, where we started, the company which formed in 1956 as one of only a, a small division within the Geological Survey of India came into being in 1958, had our first strike in Cambe, and in 59, we were in the Northeast chasing oil and gas. 1960 was the year that we struck oil in Rudra Sagar. Now this is one of the still producing oldest field. 60 years now, last year we had another new strike within the field of Rudra Sagar. So that tells you about the potential of the entire Northeast. Amongst the seven states of, or the eight states, if I count Sikkim as well, ONGC has already operated in six of them, and currently we are in five states of the Northeast. In Nagaland, we came back in 1973, did a lot of survey because we have to carry out initial surveys uh, to establish potential, get the, uh, you know, the picture of the subsurface, know where I'm going to put, put my uh, drilling well, what we call the oil well because again, it incurs a huge amount of investment. And I'm so happy to say that we struck oil in Nagaland. It, it still has a huge potential. There were some numbers which came up in the 80s. There is a field called Champang, wherein more than uh, one MMT million metric tons of oil was produced in the 80s. But sad to say, all, these, all this came to a stop in 1994. If, somebody, if some of you can recall, yesterday I was talking about that. I'm basically a geoscientist uh, looking for petroleum. But CSR, since coming here, I know how connected it is to all the efforts of a company. Since the last year, I know what the potential is. And one of the policies of the companies, you know, the corporate management uh, board is that we invest in areas where we know that we have potential. But still, as I would be uh, showing you later on, how much we still believe in Nagalan, how much we still believe in the potential, not only of its natural resources, but also of the people. Since last year, September, I have been engaged in a dialogue, both with the local stakeholders at the village level, at the tribal level, and right up to the Honorable Chief Minister 
to reinitiate and reintroduce the oil and gas industry into the area. I know there have been there has been a very long pause. So what I will can can you just go back to the previous one? So uh, to the previous slide, please. Yeah, this is just to show uh, ONGC over here, the exploration, what we look for oil and gas, it is based in Jorhat. Other than that, we have four assets. When a new discovery is made or the fields are established, they become the assets wherein only the production takes place along with little bit of exploration. So besides Jorhat, which is the South Assam shelf, we have one in Sipsagar near Nazira. We also have in Silchar, which is the Barak Valley, and in Tripura, which is a neighboring state to Naglan, I would be happy to tell you it is one of the highest gas producing online assets of ONGC. Looking for environment consciousness, the carbon footprints, and the transitional fuel, gas becomes the best option after oil. In Mizoram, we have struck gas. We have been exploring there for a number of years. There are logistic problems because the machinery and the equipment takes time to, and you know, we need roads. So with the government of Mizoram taking a very proactive part, roads are under construction, so we'll be there. So not only this, we also have, talking about environment, an R&D institute, which is into bioremediation and also biofuels are based at Jorhat. I'm just telling you this to give an opportunity, and I have been, uh, you know, um, discussing that an exposure, especially to the students, right from the high school level, ONGC would be very happy to take in groups, take them around the oil fields. We also have one of the biggest computer centers to process all the data that we have at Jorhat. Just to kindle that, you know, that spark, might be some of them would become engineers, some of them would become technicians one day for Nagaland, within Nagaland. You have a lot of other mineral resources. Currently, I think coal and limestone uh, makes a major part of it. Oil and gas can be another one. And not only that, the learning from there, they can take all the people into all parts of the country and vice versa. So, uh, next one. so this is the assessment which is done. The numbers which you are seeing there, they're huge numbers. If, uh, and I look after the Arakan belt as well, you know, which comprises the Tripura, Manipur, and Mizoram. So the entire, uh, entire area has got more than 7,600 of million metric tons of oil equivalent, which is there in the subsurface. The company's effort is to find it, establish it, and then produce it. So th that's an effort to make us less reliant on a very unstable global market wherein the prices of oil and gas keep fluctuating very much. What we are trying to do is make our Atman Nirbhar Bharat. And Nagaland definitely is a part of it. In terms of the money, the investment, this is the expenditure, which is for the entire Northeast. The major part of it comes from Assam and Tripura. There is a small uh, uh, contribution from the Barak Valley. So what we are talking about is huge numbers in terms of investment, huge num numbers in terms of the returns. The royalties, they, are, they go into much higher numbers. So th this is a, a figure which is there for last five years. And with the opening of the sector in the state of Nagaland, I know it can, uh, we are talking about CSR, we are talking about setting up industry, we are talking about setting up, uh, you know, a sustainable development. So this is what is going to charge it. This is what is going to be the basis of the CSR uh, for ONGC. Just a small picture again. This is one of the maps, what I was talking. It shows Nagaland and the areas which were studied then. We have not acquired any data after 1994. So once we acquire the data, this picture is definitely going to improve. 
the numbers of course you know the uh, not only the field of uh, champang but we have in tinafe then we have in jumukadima so th this is the natural resource the hidden resource which can be tapped of course now we also have the indradhanush gas uh, pipeline which is coming for the entire northeast the distribution of the gas this is going to make the access to the gas and also to the consumers there are some areas when we do a project we also do the technical uh, viability of that project because in some areas there is no offtake of the gas which is being produced which is in a very small quantity and it does not entail setting up of a huge industry so this kind of a distributory pipeline even household pipelines you know the city gas grids they are going to change the entire picture of energy consumption in the entire northeast this is in uh, you know uh, it dovetails with the northeast hydrocarbon vision 2030 which was done by the government of india way back in 2016 so it 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 involves all the participation right from the government to the lo local stakeholder and companies and operators like ongc and other private com operators also we are a part of this whole coming to the main topic of corporate responsible a uh, corporate social responsibility so i'm just giving you a microcosm of what we have been doing what we have been spending we have different work centers we mainly looking into uh the uh projects which are related to hygiene i am absolutely i feel absolutely privileged to be in the presence of dr patak a person whose name we have been hearing for so many years now and the effort which he has done so uh, this is the csr spend and this is just for one work center of jorhat which i am talking about but we have been into uh, hygiene we have been into medical camps we have been into education and also environment related solar light provision to different villages near our operational areas during the covid period we had a huge spend uh, from the we have a, a central csr fund foundation which is based at delhi besides the local funding which is done uh, through the local uh, work centers so in that also we had supported a number of yeah number of uh, hospitals and villages so these are the pictures they are self explanatory so you can just go through and a lot of them have been done in uh, the district of mon and dimapur in fact the district of mon was one of the adopted districts as per the guidelines of the government of india during covid period so we are also into building of uh, schools pro providing uh, the furniture and all yes and the healthcare provision of ambulances even in sports and culture uh, i'm just showing here lovelina over here because we had gone to uh, facilitate her felicitate her when uh, she won the medal but we had gone to her village and when we asked her we didn't want to give her a cash prize what we did is we asked her what did she want and i was also interacting with her coach the earliest of the coaches so they said they don't have the you know uh, the setup to uh, bring up fresh on uh, you know future uh, boxers in the area so ngc took an onus on it uh, on itself to pro provide a gymnasium at the village itself so uh, these are the activities as i was telling you so we already have been very actively engaged in csr in the northeast also within nagaland and uh, let me take this opportunity to thank each one of you because there is a huge amount of learning which i have come to know the way an organized csr can change the whole scenario the whole landscape and i also believe that it is not only the sustainable development that we should be looking for but also sustainable csr thank you so much namaskar thank you ma'am may i call upon shrimati amrita ganguli head partnerships tata steel foundation yes ma'am
Thank you. So the start of this session, and clearly it's an advantage to be the last speaker because everything I had to say has already been covered by my panelists. But as an opening comment, I would like to make a very personal observation about everybody in this room, the organizers, everybody on the panel, is that fundamentally everybody here is crazy, mad, and they have certain elements of lunacy. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. It takes a certain amount of madness, passion, and that drive to make the impossible possible. I'm happy to represent an organization that pretty much set the journey for India's industrialization uh, in 1907. And like all the startups and the NGOs that are present in this room, there was this one young man, Jamsetji Nasarwanji Tata, who said, why can't I change the destiny of the country by bringing in industrialization? And Tata Steel, the company that I represent, was the first flagship company of a brand which is today respected as one of the most powerful and ethical brands in the world. So the privilege here is to just see the potential that I see in the room of so many more powerful stories that our country and Nagaland per se is capable of building. So a round of applause again to madness, if nothing else. I, I would love to give facts and figures, and I know especially I feel under-equipped with the kind of data that we saw, but as an introduction to Tata Steel, I, I would keep that aside because here in the capacity of CSR, I'm representing Tata Steel Foundation. Uh, the journey that most of you may not be aware of is that apart from doing what is now called CSR uh, for over 100 years, uh, because the philosophy of our founder was to say that in a free enterprise, community is not a stakeholder. It's the very purpose of existence. And that's the philosophy with which Tata Steel has been doing community development, social entrepreneurship, different kinds of interventions, including education, public health, livelihoods, water, skill development, women entrepreneurship. It's a very wide portfolio. But what we decided to move away from CSR-based portfolio, Tata Steel Foundation now, as of April 1st, we are possibly a baby in this panel right now, uh, is looking at doing social development as a registered Section 8 company. We are now an implementing body with over 900 uh, colleagues who are as mad as the people here, who we believe will be change makers for the kind of interventions we require in primarily Orisha and Jharkhand. Yesterday we heard the statistics where about 1% of the the national CSR budgets are attributed to the Northeast. And our data says that a measly 8% is for all of Eastern India collectively. And, and primarily while Tata Steel is present in Jharkhand and Orisha, we felt the need to create a bit of noise around this. That why can't funding that is available to us can deconcentrate from East, Western and Northern parts of the country. And strategically and you know, collaboratively put where the need is immensely felt, which is all of Eastern and Northeastern India. It's a journey we have just embarked on, but I feel that the way, while we cannot solve all the problems simultaneously, the priority that we have placed as an organization is to say, let's look at Jharkhand and Odisha first. We have impacted about 3 million lives, uh, the cumulative spends of about nearly 2,000 cro uh, 2, crores. Uh, with uh, you know, an intention to do a saturation-based models of the primary problems we are trying to solve. But we are often asked, why just Jharkhand and Odisha? You are you're a powerful company, you are a big company, you have the funds, why don't you do it in the rest of the country as well? The answer is really simple. The answer is that we need to focus on problem, you know, like probably solving some problems first. So the model we have adopted, not just in Jharkhand and, East and, and Orisha, but also in the rest of the country, uh, it's an honor to talk about a platform which was started as a tribal identity uh, exchange platform where we had you know, cultural exchanges and uh, academic exchanges on problems that are impacting not just one state or one community, but the entire nation and the underserved issue that the, the tribal community was facing. Samvad, in the course of nine years, and we don't even use our logo in that platform. Today, 
represents an ecosystem that has reached out to a fabulous amount of cohorts who have become change makers themselves. It's an absolute privilege to talk about our tribal leadership program. Uh, from Northeast alone, we have about you know, 20 plus uh, cohorts who have done some fantastic work in the Northeast. We have something called a tribal um, you know, fellowship, uh, Samvat fellowship uh, track that we follow. Again, we have had about nine uh, scholars in our fellowship program from the Northeast who have done brilliant cultural preservation work which where we have supported. And last but not the least, we are deeply invested in the culture and the art piece. There again, we discovered that the Northeast has a magical presence uh, with, with art and culture. So we cover music, we cover handicraft, we cover textile. And so where we can't be physically present, what we do is our Samwad network has now given us a, a fraternity of partners, of collaborators, of change makers, a lot of them youngsters. And, in, in, and personally, given my, my daughter is also 17, uh, I wish urban children and privileged children had that kind of passion and fire in their belly, which they don't. And, 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 the, and what I would like to conclude with keeping the time urgencies in mind is that we should look at not as something that we are doing Nagaland a favor representing you know, a corporate fund that we are you know, invited to disperse, but rather look at the opportunities here. In fact, Pragina mentioned yesterday that challenges are opportunities. And, and that's a similar belief that we have, that I would look at us as partners and us as collaborators and all of you in the room, and especially my liaisoning officer here as well. You know, she was in tears when she was telling us about her program, and that's the kind of love and passion that I see in a lot of you. So let's continue to madness, let's continue with development, and looking forward to collaborations. So, and, and a round of applause for everybody present here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. May I request Sri Sheikh, dream a dream, to kindly come and take your time, after which Sri Manmohan Singh, Kavalya Foundation, to follow. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and warm <clears throat> good afternoon. I'm really grateful to the government of Jharkhand for giving us the opportunity to share what we have been doing, what we have learned, what we have learning from our failure, and how we have been striving to thrive in this sector. Although um, there is a only few minutes we have to share, so we are not going to share the PPT, the entire PPT of the organization. We can only go through what we have done so far. It's a Dream a Dream is a uh, almost two decade old organization and it has been started uh, with the volunteer work <coughs> in Bangalore. And after that, learning from that, we have shifted to uh, after school program, and then uh, Career Connect program, starting that. And uh, while doing, we have realized that the teacher development is uh, one of the crucial area. We have to do that. Uh, basically, traditionally, the Indian education system in crisis. And because of this recognition, we have been here, we have been finding the solution, and we have been trying to make it more sustainable everywhere from Northeast to every part of India. Dream and Dream has been working in five states. We are basically concentrating to make the young people to thrive. And there is, uh, we have been, been providing uh, the kind of a space, support system at the government school level with the partnership and collaborative mechanism at different states like Jharkhand, um, Delhi, Uttaranchal, uh, um, Telangana. And recently, we have been planning to introduce uh, uh, social well-being curriculum in Nagaland. So the focus is more around uh, how the young people are going to get the support, uh, going, to get, uh, going to get thrive uh, in the system, in the ecosystem, how they are going to get uh, some sort of a employability scale, which is more important uh, to, <clears throat> to, uh, to be the part of employment generation or being employed in any of the organization. Uh, and the next slide, last one. Another thing we have been thinking about that, like um, uh, our traditional education system is more focused on the marks, rank, uh, like everything which is connected to success. But that is not success. Success is largely depends upon the social behavior issues, skills, how the children are, because one of the studies which I want to mention has been recently published in American uh, Journal, 
medical journal the the, the children like it's a 20 year uh, longitudinal study uh, the children studying in the kindergarten having skills of sharing uh, friendliness so they have a high chances to be the part of the higher education so those are the skills how we can in, uh, integrate in the education system we have been trying and we have been doing in a different part of the country how this mind shift uh, change is going to happen one is the direct imp impact working with uh, uh, the stakeholder second is uh, system demonstration at the state level and third is uh, building the field you can go go ahead with us um, we have been directly working with the 10000 young kid an impact is almost 3 million children in India. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. May I call upon Sri Manmohan Singh Kalgila Foundation? You have two minutes to share and we will move to the valedictory session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Namaskar, everyone. Uh, I'm Manmohan Singh, but not from Punjab. Uh, I'm from Jharkhand and I represent uh, Piramal Foundation and Cavalier Education Foundation. Piramal Foundation started its works in 1932 by building first Harijani schools in Rajasthan, first teacher training college in Rajasthan. So it's an old history of working for the community. And uh, since 2008, we decided not to set up a parallel system, but to build the capability of government because government has mandate and money, both, which nobody can match. And how do we build the capability of the last mile functionaries in health and education in particular? Uh, that's what we are trying to do. We, are, we work across 26 states now. We have 4,000 people working in the foundations uh, to support the government in building the capability of various kind. Uh, we also run something called Gandhi Fellowship, where I will request uh, government to encourage young people to apply. This Gandhi Fellowship is a two years full-time uh, residential program. Uh, people come from all kind of disciplines across the country. We are running this for 15 years. We have 2,000 alumni. And put, the idea is that how do you build talented people and attract them to work in the project we have been talking about, right? Otherwise, general aspiration is to go towards, the, there are very few people who are from IIT and trying to go to the last village. So how do we ensure that we have many such people, right, in India and working in the corners of the villages to solve the real problem? In Northeast, we have 800 people working for last uh, 10 years uh, and largest being the Assam for whatever reason. We have been talking about that. And uh, thank you to government of Nagaland for inviting us. We are working with aspirational district across the country, which is the most backward districts, where 1.5% CSR are being spent, but the population is 22%. And that's the case, not just of this state, across India. Uh, and we are very proud to say that the, we have very good experience in Northeast, including Nagaland. For last six months, we are working in Kipri. And we assure that we are going to be there for the next five, seven years because development takes time. And we don't want to do one intervention. And our larger approach is that the assets and infrastructure are critical, important. But the private player like us who play a very small role, how do we ensure the schools where you have the infrastructure, teacher, they are paid by the government, or you have the hospital, there are doctors, but unfortunately, the quality still is the issue. So can we play a role to improve the quality where government is bringing the scale? So that's the role we want to play. Uh, so that's one work we are doing in Nagaland. The second is we are trying to focus with the tribal health across the country. India has about 10% of population living in tribal areas. If you look at the health indicator, it's a very, very bad situation. So in Nagaland, we worked in 11 districts on a campaign-based mode on tuberculosis. We reached out to 140,000 people. And out of that, 88,000 were screened, 17,000 sputum were collected. And finally, uh, you know, the 61 people had tuberculosis in that process. 
but you know one person can spread it to five to seven people. So that happened because of community-based work we have been doing with the hyper-local organizations. So thank you for all those who participated in this campaign, not just in Nagaland, but across the country we have about thousands of such hyper-local NGOs who may not be compliant who does not have the process and system in place, but they are dedicated, they understand the community, they live for that. If there is a flood, they will die with the community and not run away like you and me. So we are working with such group of people who understand the community and work with the community on one side and work with the government on the other side. So thank you, thank you so much. We look forward to build further relationship with Langaland government and contribute in whatever ways we can do in the development and ease of living of people in Nagaland. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, sir. May I call upon for the concluding remarks, Sri Rainey Wilfred Ayers, Joint Secretary, Ireland, to do the honors. Because of the paucity of time, we are in a process of moving into the next session. Uh, there are many questions that are there with the participants and as well as the dignitaries present. I would like to make only two, three statements. Uh, the word used was uh, some of the participants are uh, kind of having an overdrive to get things done. So some other person has mentioned they are the magicians who make things happen without whatever resources available. Let me start with the uh, Joint Secretary present here, Mr. Dharivar, sir. The support that has come from there and to ensure that things are happening in Nagaland, that is amazing. We are not looking at CSR donors, we are not looking at companies, we are not looking at investors. From the whole system, when this discussion started, the, the, the support that has come from CEO Ida and, and from Commissioner Nagaland to mobilize all the districts, the support that came from Commissioner's office saying that, get it done, we will be there to ensure that the projects are getting done. That is the support system that we are assur assuring to you that it will be done. And when we look at the big picture, you all are part of a jigsaw. Each of you has a part to play. Uh, let me just elaborate for a minute. Let me take the case of Boeing. Uh, all of a sudden, we got a call saying that we would like to engage in Nagaland. So we asked, what would you like to do? So the, the question was in reverse order. What would you like to have? Then we gave a bucket list of items. Then it was like, OK, I gave item of five. And immediately it was like, OK, one is done, two is done, three is done, four is done. OK, fine. So immediate re response was that. The next thing, the question was that, yes, dialysis unit is your first priority. How do we get it done? So I asked, what you would like to have? Then we connected with the health department and the space was allotted. Within a week time, the whole construction work and other things started. They came with the first part of the puzzle, the infrastructure. Then the doctors for you came with the second part of the puzzle saying that we will provide the manpower and the facilities and other things to run it for the next 10 years. Then we mentioned that, yes, we have this problem of training of nurses for their BSc in Nagaland. Then comes the next solution from the doctors for you side saying that, okay, we are willing to take up a nursing college in PPP mode, along with critical manpower for locations, wherever the CPSUs are bringing critical medical equipment. So wherever we have difficulties with uh, your ultrasound technicians, doctors for you has agreed to provide that solution. Now, when we comes to the solution with respect to employment, there comes the JK Trust. They said like, okay, we are willing to train you for industry competent tailoring uh, persons. They committed and they started their sender and by next month it will be getting inaugurated. And the larger vision of that is that it is going to be something that will be fitting into bringing Nagaland a textile development park at some point of time in the future. And they have given a non-committed MOU in this regard also that they will look into the future to establish a textile park. Now, each of you sitting here, uh, let us go to Tata Steel. They have been mentioning tribal leadership, native tracks, development of music, documentation of traditional culture. So their interest and tra training the youngsters to work in the developmental field. All these things, let me, I can pick one, one person each and say how they are part of the bigger picture. 
let's say sanitation from the side of sir and the dimapur project is only the pilot to see what can be done in nagaland to be scaled up across the health sectors and education institution that is the discussion that is ongoing let it be skill development let it be vocational training uh, let me say the case of coaching uh, shipyard when they came they were really hesitant they were willing to give only one ro plan yesterday they came and handed over the uh, agreement for 20 ro plans for nagaland that is covering all across the state or whoever has come with little bit of hesitation to nagaland has agreed to be a partner for the development and we are more than happy to have you all around here kindly pardon me for not taking any of the specific names because all of you have equally it is not about the money it is your passion and the commitment with which you have come forward to nagaland so let me thank all of them for uh, that and uh, wonderful job you all have done together for nagaland each of your solution let it let me take cold storage let me take our plan let me take health sector intervention let me take the education sector intervention everywhere one or another foundation or company has agreed to be a partner with it and the last part of the whole thing is that the new set of commitments that have been coming up uh, madam has herself mentioned in the uh, podium that she will be picking up some of the projects from the bucket list of uh, shamato district and uh, other departments also and uh, titan group has come forward saying that they will be taking up some project from industries department and another skill development projects also so we are thankful we would be looking forward for others also to come forward and uh, really really thankful to you for making it happen for nagaland thank you thanks a lot thank you sir ladies and gentlemen as we move to the valedictory session may we all put our hands together once again for our distinguished guests, our dignitaries who have presented us with their experiences. And I hope our delegates and our stall in charges will take the opportunity to reach out to them and also take the concerns forward with a collaborative attitude and also in partnering and finding solution together for the state of Naglin and her people. As we do the group photograph, May I request all our delegates and the stall in charges, may I request all the volunteers to kindly lead everyone in the hall. We will do our valedictory session now. We are running out of time, so may I call upon everyone to please fill the conclave. Please drop everything and please come to the conclave so that we can do our valedictory session. On the dais, we would be having our CEO, Investment and Development Authority of Naglan Aiden, Sri Alam Temshi Jamir, who will give our the welcome address. And for the special address, we have Sri Niba Krono, Honorable Minister Planning and Coordination, Land Revenue and Parliamentary Affairs, Naglan. For the vote of thanks, Sri Kesonya Hyome, IAS, Secretary Works and Housing Government of Naglan, to do the vote of thanks. So as we continue to look forward, may I please request everyone to come to the conclave room to be part of the final session. Thank you very much. May I request the concerned officers and the volunteers to please lead everyone into the conclave room for the valedictory session. We have our respective dignitaries here on the dais for the session. Can you please take your seats? We would like to encourage everyone from the organizations and the departments to please get in touch with the companies who are here. As you have already heard their experiences and the projects that they are running in the state and all over the country. So we encourage you to get in touch, exchange your business cards and perhaps take it forward in days to come. This is an opportunity for you to connect and also take the conversation forward. May I request everyone to move towards the Conclave Hall. 
you are requested to please be seated. Those to please come to the conclave hall now. For all those who are standing outside, you are also requested to be part of the conclave. This would be the last session of the day and to the ending of the Kohima chapter. Tomorrow is the Dimapu chapter in which the program will be held in Dimapur. We would like to encourage for those who continue to stay for the program to also be part of the Dimapur program as well. May I request who all are standing to be seated, please? We have the tea break after the valedictory session, so we encourage you to do the networking and the connection during your exchange. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here now for the valedictory session here at NBCC Convention Center. For the welcome address, may I welcome Sri Alam Temshi Jamir, CEO Investment and Development Authority of Naglan Aiden, to do the welcome address. Sir. Honorable Minister Planning and Coordination, Sri Niba Kruno, our Secretary Works and Housing, Sri Kesonya Yome, the lovely corporates who are present here this evening, and the media who have been covering up this event for the last couple of days. My dear friends from Aidan and the people from the government of Nagaland and people who have been helping us, the corporates who have specially contributed to, towards the, the CSR uh, contributions to the state. You may be wondering why we have had this CSR convention. So in very brief terms, I will be telling you why we've had it. And I don't know whether it should be a welcome word or a goodbye word, but uh, uh, to explain why we had this CSR conclave. Yes, the people of Nagaland do need money. And the people of Nagaland do deserve to get whatever money that uh, is available if it is due to them. But apart from the issue of money, you see, there was a thinking within the people of Nagaland that government is all in all. No doubt we were a social welfare state and the government was to provide the things which the people needed. But over the years, we have seen changes of this respect going on, but there was no change in the mindset of the people. People still expected, expects, and I think they will still expect government to do everything. And therefore, this CSR was held, was called together with an intention to tell the people that there is something beyond the government. That there is something beyond the government in the sense that there are bigger things which are growing globally around us. When I was young, when somebody said that man walking on the street is a lakpati, we thought, wow, that's big money. Then he became a millionaire. Then now it has become billionaires, and soon I think we'll cross the trillionaire stage of corporates like Elon Musk and others are heading. And the private sector is becoming bigger and bigger, whereas the government role is shrinking. The state is shrinking. And it is time and it is necessary for the people of Nagaland lodged in the tiny villages on the mountaintop to realize 
that there is a world beyond Nagaland. And that is the reason why this CSR convention was held. People are bringing up, the, you know, looking at the private sector as agents of change. Private sector is taking up the, the, the development aspect of growth. But here the people are being left out. And this is one of the main thinking why we have decided to have this CSR conclave and to have a, you know, the, for the people to have a handshake with the private sector. And we are so grateful that all of you have ma made it possible for this, the dream that we had to take place. We thank all the corporates who have come here to participate in the last two days to make the event very, very interesting and uh, warm. And in fact, we have a list of um, expressions of interest already signed. Nine, seven districts, Noklak, Mon, Shamator, Chumukidima, Shamator, they have signed expression of interest with various companies. We have three districts of Dimapur who have signed for uh, school education. And then we have uh, you know, nine companies who have uh, given expression of interest for establishment, you know, helping the, 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 the various activities of the departments. I will not read them out all. We have even got Alexa coming into the education department. I hope the department will be able to turn as efficient as the Alexa. Then we have lots of technical departments, nine of them, uh, no, 14 of them who have si uh, signed letters of interest with the de departments. Apart from this, there are many other things. This is the report which has been given to me this evening. But apart from this, there are many other uh, uh, you know, the, the, the negotiations going on. And I'm sure this will take time to take place. But we are happy. We are happy that this event has taken place, that you are with us, that you have been with us, and that we have opened the eyes of the people of Nagaland on the capabilities and the possibilities of the private sector and the corporate world. That is one. Now, um, I am sure many of you who have attended the uh, closed door session with the Honorable Governor last night. For me, it was a mind-blowing experience with so much corporates Maybe even 20 of them, with the likes of even Trehan, I thought he was stuck in his hospital in uh, Medanta in Delhi, or this Bajaj and all these other groups. But as they shared with us their knowledge about development, I have found that they, each one of them had very deep, interesting knowledge about Nagaland, which we did not, which we did not have. So it's amazing to think that corporate heads and corporates are thinking of Nagaland. And with that perspective, I'm sure that things are going to change quickly. We know that the private world has, private sector has no boundaries. And it is slowly flooding into Nagaland and then there's hope for our people. And with that kind of a perspective, we are, you know, we are, we are overwhelmed by the kind of in, uh, the, the response that we have got from the corporates, especially from what we have seen last night. We've had uh, virtual uh, uh, connections with them. We had physical presence of many of the speakers and corporates. And it was really great and fantastic. And I hope that the corporate world will continue to show the interest, and not only show the interest, but to come forward to work to change this small corner of India into a global location. Our location has got its advantages. We have the capability of opening up the borders of India and trade with Southeast Asian countries. Our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, and his, his specific concern for roads is changing the face of Nagaland. And all these changes are happening, and I think together we can make Nagaland a contributing state in this great country. <clears throat> We have had um, another session with the bankers this afternoon. <coughs> another amazing se session. We always think that gov money is a problem. Naga people think that money is a problem. Everybody has a lot of money in their hands, and we, the Nagas, don't have money. <coughs> but today we have learned that <coughs> in one day alone, they have dispersed 230 crores. 
Amazing. That's money. Into the hands of Naga people. There's a commitment for another 500 crores by the State Bank of India. And that is money. Another 160 crores by the Small Development Bank of uh, in the Northeast. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> That's also money. <coughs> So when we translate all these activities that have taken place in the last two days and how it will impact the life of the individuals in Nagaland, we are happy. We know that things will change. We know that things are going to move forward. And this is the happy ending that we all talk about. And for this, we only have to thank you all. Thank you very much indeed for coming to Nagaland. And although it's supposed to be a welcome address, I think it is sounding more like a, a thank you note. And I hope that the association with Nagaland will not end only with this CSR conclave. <coughs> I will expect each and every corporate to keep in touch with the people that you have got in touch over here and we will pray that God will make you more and more rich, that God will bless the Indian economy, the Indian you know, growth, so that you know, the, 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 the growth, the, the, the riches can be shared, and the Nagaland also will grow along with the country. So I have many more things to say, but uh, we get overwhelmed, and therefore that is uh, all I will say. And I will thank you for your kind, patient, you know, participation so late in the evening. And I hope that you will have a good journey back home. I, have, I hope that you have a good stay over here. The, like I said last night, I think the amenities may not have been uh, satisfactory, but we have given it out of love. And I hope you will accept our gesture. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. And it is here that I would like to welcome Sri Niba Kronu, Honorable Minister Planning and Coordination, Land Revenue and Parliamentary Affairs, Nagaland, for the special address. First of all, I want to congratulate Alan Timshi, former Chief Secretary and now CEO Aiden and his colleagues friends, Rennie Wilfred and others for making this uh, program successful. In this program, I'm glad that our Works and Housing Secretary Kasone is here with us. My dear corporate friends, today, even at this last hour also, I could see many of you here with us. Those who have stayed till the last, that shows that you have a very, very special concern on us. There are some people, they come, they go. But you have come here and been here with us till the last. It is a great honor to all of us. When you come to Nagaland, I want you to know something about Nagaland and the Naga people in brief. And then I want you to be our ambassador to outside world. You see, when we talk about our Naga people, you may be thinking that uh, why this political issue 
what has happened, or how it is uh, Jammu and Kashmir and why Nagaland. So I want to tell you in brief about Nagaland and the Naga people. Our Naga issue, the political issue, is started way back from 1929. You know, British rule India. And then British people, they came to these parts of our land. They have captured some parts of the Naga areas, but not all. And that point of time, there was a stiff resistance from the Naga people. Then there was a battle with the British, but later on, British came to capture this area. Then at that point of time, you know, this Simon Commission in 1935, they came and they asked our people, if we go and if we leave India, what is your opinion? Then Naga people said, if you go and leave India, you leave us alone and for which memorandum was submitted to Simon Commission in 1935. So from there the issue starts. Then when British leave India, left India, then Naga people also have declared independence on 14 Agos, then India on 15 Agos, then the Naga leaders met Mahatma Gandhi in Delhi, but unfortunately, Mahatma Gandhi was shot dead. Then, after that, Nehru came into power, and then the issue, the conflict has already started. When the British, they came to these parts of our Naga areas, they have come to know what resources we have. We have oil, we have coal, we have gold, or so many minerals. And that is why British people, they did not allow others to come to these parts and explore. So, inner line regulation was imposed. And those people who want to come to this area have to take a special permit, what we call it inner line permit. Because when, when they left India, then the British people knowing the resources that we have, they have offered to the Naga people to have a British crown colony, something like Taiwan, Hong Kong, and others. But we refuse. Now our people are placed in Nagaland, that is all Nagas. Then there are some in Manipur, there are some in Arunachal, and a little portion in Assam, and then some portion in Myanmar. We have our representative in Myanmar, MPs, MLS, also in Myanmar. Our huge resources are also there. So our desire is that we come together live together under one administrative unit, which we have resolved so many times, that is what we call integration. But it is taking time. From 1947 onwards, the conflict starts. Then, 50s also, in 1947, in 1947 also, we have reached uh, some agreement 
Then in 1960, we have uh, reached another agreement and brought this statehood. But even then, the conflict starts, and in 1975, there was another agreement, accord, but that also has failed. Then from 1997, another ceasefire, another talk is going on, and now the talk is going on for 25 years between the government of India and the Naga nationalist political groups. But this is a peace talk. So at least now there is a peace. And for us, we don't harass outsiders. So now, we are hopeful that there will be a solution and people will start working with the banks. And for that, we are bringing a new land laws. I'm looking after land revenue. Our land holding system is a little bit different. The, the land belongs to the villagers, to the community. So, now we are going to bring a new land laws. Because the land laws, what we were using earlier, it was of 1886, which is too old. But now, the investment have to come, the bank have to come, and so, in the next cabinet, we'll be bringing that uh, new land laws. It, a draft has been re ready. And in the coming assembly, we're going to pass the bill. So with this, every one of you, anywhere, you can come and invest here. You have a scope. Like our petroleum and other resources, coal, limestones, and other resources. It is unexplored. Unexplored. All these resources are lying. Now, all these resources are unexplored. It is just lying underground. And the time will come for you to come and invest. Now we are grateful to all of you that from the companies, the corporates, the banks, you all have come. Now, under externally aided projects, Asian Development Banks, World Bank, and others are coming. But here, the, now we could see that many nationalized banks are also here with us. We are so grateful to all of you. And especially in the banking area, we have to start working with the bank. Because we have a big scope here. The other yesterday, I was talking about agriculture, and for which our union finance minister was also talking about agriculture. Here, everything can grow here. And that what it grows here, the test is also different. The environment is different. And our honey products, our coffee products, our pineapple products, these are all special. And this is, this is one of the biodiversity hotspot area, and for which our honey are also, it is different from others. So, friends, after your coming here, we will be expecting your visit again. Before my entry into politics, I was also financing the farmers. We happened to organize the farmers, and then we started plantation of fruit trees.
So then later on, I was told to involve in politics. But now I have uh, less time. But even then, here, once, once you invest here, I can see there is an opportunity uh, for all of us, win-win situation. And for the corporate, rich corporate people, you have come here, you have come here to improve our education, our health systems, and others. I'm so grateful to all, all of you. As you go back, if you have seen something good about Naga people, tell others. But if there is something unpleasant, keep it with you. <laughs> so with these few words, on behalf of the government of Nagaland, I wish every one of you all the best and a safe journey. Thank you. Hello, check. Sorry. Thank you, sir, for the word of encouragement and also showing the way with the hope. And it is here that I would like to call for the vote of thanks. Sri Kesonya Hyome, IAS, Secretary, Works and Housing Government of Nanglin, to share his thoughts. Good evening. Good evening. How's the Josh? Well, the Josh is clearly high. You have made it to the last minute of the session. And we want to thank you for bearing with us despite the humidity. After almost two days of very meaningful dialogue and exchange of commitments, it is my delightful opportunity and privilege to propose the vote of thanks to all those who have been responsible to make this mega event possible. On behalf of the state government, in absentia, I wish to express my heartfelt gratitude to the Union Minister for Finance and Corporate Affairs for making it to Nagaland, spending three days to be a part of this historic conclave. The personal attention and interest that the Union Minister had shown has been well acknowledged by the people of the state and we are truly grateful to the Honourable Minister. Secondly and most importantly, our gratitude goes out to all the corporates and the captains of the industry who have made it from across India to be a part of this two-day conclave in the capital city of Kohima traveling all the way from various parts of the country. Besides investing your time and services, we are extremely thankful to you for the investment commitments and the smart ideas that you all have shared and put forward for the state government. This clearly is a giant step towards bringing the private sector and the government closer together in governance realm, and we deeply appreciate and value your concern for the state. The enormous synergy that such partnerships can generate can only be imagined when all resources are channeled properly. I also wish to thank all the entrepreneurs and the enterprises of the CM Residential Complex at 6.30. A very good evening, and I hope you have a wonderful stay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there is coffee and tea, and you know where to find I hope all the delegates will take the time to interact and also build connection if you have not. Thank you very much. <laughs>